was to be the first meeting since last spring of the two greatest teams in professional hockey. But because of the events of this past week, the night has become a deeper, sadder, and more personal occasion. As the Flyers family, the team, the members of the organization and its fans gathered to mourn the loss of one of its own. It will be the Oilers and Flyers later. But first, we ask you to share in a memorial ceremony for Pelle Lindbergh, next on PRISM. Good evening, everybody. I'm Bobby Taylor. It's been a difficult and trying last few days, not only for the players and the people that are associated with the Flyers, but I'm sure with you fans as well. Tonight, we'll pay tribute to a young man who touched us all and left a part of himself with everyone that he met, Pelle Lindbergh. With me is Flyers coach Mike Keenan. Michael, the uh, goaltenders are always considered a breed apart, and this young man certainly was. Well, he distinguished himself on the ice, certainly, Bob, as being the best National Hockey League goaltender last year, and, of course, he was leading us in that direction again this year with his fine play, and he had some uh, things that I guess I could share with the fans now, and, and knowing so the idiosyncrasies of Pelle and the anecdotes that uh, would bring him a little bit closer to us. Uh, a couple of things that uh, he used to always prepare himself. For example, we had the great series with Washington last year, and it was during the course of that game I became very concerned about dehydration of Pelly, and I went in and demanded me take off the sweater, and I grabbed the sweater and took it off, and and uh, he looked at me, and the trainers come running. Oh no, no, you can't do that. He has a special idiosyncrasies. And after the game, after we won, he, he came to me and said. Uh, coach I guess it doesn't really make that much difference and then I thought we had that problem solved until this year in his last game I went up to him and I was talking to him leaning over him talking about some of the uh, things that he should be doing challenging the goalie and so on or challenging the shooters rather and uh, at the same time I kicked his mask and gloves on the floor and he jumps up immediately and adjusts them on the floor and fixes them and straightens them and said I still have to have my uh, s certain uh, idiosyncrasies in place. He didn't use that word, obviously, but uh, he was telling me that I got away with it once, never again. So he, uh, he had his own way, and one thing that we always used to do, too, is uh, shake hands after a win. I remember I walked in one night and uh, got preoccupied with some of the post-game activity and forgot to go over there, and it dawned on me uh, about five minutes later, and sure enough, he's sitting in the corner waiting for me to come over and shake his hand. So. He was a, a different individual, but a, a, a great human being. How are you going to handle that locker room? That's a very uh, difficult challenge for us all tonight, but uh, I believe in this hockey club and, and the people that are on it. They have great character, and they've shown it in the past, and they've shown it for the last three or four days of very trying times. And the strength of the team as a group is extremely great, and I think the personal strength of each player has been brought out in this tragedy and I'm sure that we'll make it through the night somehow. Thanks, Mike. Thank you very much, Bob. Let's go down now to Ed Van Imp and Gene Hart. Eddie Van Imp, certainly tragedy is no stranger to the Philadelphia Flyers organization and I go back to May 1st of 1977. Well, at that time, uh, the Flyers lost Barry Ashby, who was a very valued defenseman prior to becoming, you know, a, a real asset as a coach. And thinking back to that, Gene, I mean, the, it was tough for the Flyers to accept at that time. You know, he, he was so well-liked, so well-respected, and so well-thought of throughout the hockey world. And it was such a big loss that it took some time to, to adjust and to deal with it. Eddie, on Sunday, there was a finality to Pelly Lindbergh because of the severity of his injuries. You were advised in April 1st in a dressing room here to my left, just following practice before a playoff game with Toronto that Barry had contracted leukemia. Was there a feeling of finality then, or was there hope for him? No, I think, Gene, there's an awful lot of hope, because you knew Barry, I know Barry, and when Barry said that he was going to beat the disease, he just took it, because Barry was saying it, that he was going to do it, and he just kind of said, well, if Barry said he's going to beat leukemia, you know, it's got said and done, but that was not the case, but I think that there is an awful lot of, I guess, hope 
and respect towards Barry Ashby. We just expected him to beat the disease. Eddie, in a sense, you were the senior citizen of that club. When did it begin to dawn on you that he wasn't going to make it? Well, I think, Gene, that uh, I guess the more we visited Barry, the more we, you know, were with him and spent time with him and everything else, he realized as hard as he was fighting, the disease was winning. And we went to visit him in the hospital, and uh, you could tell, you know, the disease was, you know, in the advanced stages. And I guess uh, the club just felt that uh, Barry had more than he could really handle. No one's an expert, I can't believe, in this era, but since you've lived through that, if you were to go in that dressing room next door and talk to these young players, how might you ask them or tell them to handle this? Well, I think a lot like Barry. I think that Pelly is a very, very respected player, you know, throughout the league and especially with his teammates. Barry loved to win. Pelly loved to win. And I think what you could do most for them is to do them proud by going out and doing a great job and winning the game and having a great season. We'll be back with more after this. <laughs> the start of the special ceremonies and to Pelly uh, this evening and Eddie a lot of people probably wonder why the game is being played and Edmonton graciously offered to cancel a game or at least postpone it for a while and, and in a way when you really think about it we think back uh, uh, being familiar uh, in this situation and other players that playing the game tonight is probably the best medicine that this young team could have. I couldn't agree more, Bobby. I think it was awfully nice of the Edmonton Oilers and Glenn Sather in particular to offer to postpone the game, but I totally agree with Flyers management with uh, playing the game tonight. I think that the game had to be played sooner or later. Uh, Pelly's, uh, you know, left and, and, and uh, will no longer be, you know, with the Flyers or with us at all. And, and uh, I think for the team to get underway as quickly as possible, I think that, you know what, Bobby, that, that's what Pelly would want himself. You know, you talked... I've talked to a couple of players throughout uh, the day, and, and they've said that to the last one, that, you know, Gump wants to win, he, uh, and, he, and he loves the challenge, and it's been brought out about that, and how he'd like to play the top teams and the best there is, and uh, he he would want them to play, and he would want them to uh, go out there and, and do their best, and it, it's almost a tonic in a sense that when you do hurt or when you do have anger built up in you, the best thing to do is do something physical, is to, to work out that aggression, work out that anger and that sorrow and in doing something physical and doing it, you know, getting the sweat, so to speak, on the brow because there's not much you can do. The tears have gone. You, you, you can only cry so often, and now, now you vent that anger. You've got to go on about business, and I think the Flyers will do exactly that tonight. The, the game may start slowly, but I think it'll build in momentum as the game progresses. But also, you have to look at the other team that's coming in here tonight, the Edmonton Oilers, the Stanley Cup defending champions. It's also tough on them to come in here and play in front of, you know, a Philadelphia crowd, a Philadelphia team, after losing such a respected player from their lineup, you know, as recent as Sunday morning. So I think that uh, Edmonton is very kind of maybe not cautious, but maybe very aware of the situation here in the spectrum tonight. And, and uh, I think one once the game's underway, maybe a couple of shifts, you know, when each player gets out there for a little while, uh, they'll take their mind, you know, to business. And that's the game at hand tonight here in the spectrum. And once the game starts, I think the players will feel relief. They've got their mind on what they have to do out there. And I think you'll find that they're professionals. They'll do it. Edmonton has, are wearing uh, black armbands uh, on their left arm. The Flyers have uh, a small number 31 on their left shoulder. Uh, which you'll be able to see throughout this this game. You know what I liked here in, in, in the Philadelphia area with this tragedy with Pelly Lindbergh is that the, the way the people, the fans, uh, you know, hockey fans and just people in general in the street, the way they've responded as far as you know, respect for Pelly Lindbergh. They, they feel the, the hurt, you know, the uh, maybe a little bit of the anger that some people feel that Pelly at such a young age, such a great athlete, was taken. But also, I've got to give credit to the other sports teams in the league, hockey, as well as, uh, you know, different sports teams here in the city. Uh, an awful lot of their star players and the different teams here in the city, uh, you know, respond with, with various statements. And I think that, uh, I think an athlete, doesn't matter what sport it's in, I think you've got some kind of a common bond. And I think through the tragedy with Pelly Lindbergh, that was shown here by all our professional sports teams here in Philadelphia. It carried over throughout the hockey world as well. Uh, Mike Emmerich uh, told me uh, that they're doing the game at Madison Square Garden on Monday evening, and uh, that is probably one of the toughest buildings uh, in all of sport to play and to gain the affection of the fans. And 
<clears throat> you knew that they were going to have a minute of silence for Pelly before the game, and they were very apprehensive because they did not know how the crowd would react, and especially at being a flyer. And they asked for this silence, and he said it was so quiet you could hear a pin drop. And then after it was over, they all gave a thunderous applause uh, in respect for that young man. So it, it just illustrates uh, the great impact that he had, not only in this city and the Delaware Valley, but throughout North America and as well as Europe, definitely as well as Europe. The Flyer players are now coming on the ice as well as Edmonton. And they'll be lining up at their respective blue lines. Okay, there's an awful lot of nervous stomachs out there right now with the both teams skating to the blue lines awaiting the start of the ceremonies. It's awkward. It's so awkward. You, and I'm sure everybody knows that. It, it's no different for a player as it is for an ordinary person when they suffer loss and a tragedy such as this. It, you never know what to say. You never know what it, if it's the right thing or you never know what to do. You never, you're never sure if that's the right thing. Let's now go down to our partner, Gene Hart. All of our good friends, what was to have been tonight a shimmering evening of spectacular hockey with the two greatest teams in the professional game, has become instead a deeply more personal occasion as we, the Flyers family, the team, the organization, and especially you fans, gather to grieve over the loss of one of our own. But really, since Pelly Lindbergh's entire existence exuded nothing but the positive things in life, what I'd like to do this evening is make the theme of our ceremony not the morning of his death, but the celebrating of a life that we in Philadelphia were privileged to share. But please, first, let me assure you, particularly the youngsters, that our sorrow will diminish and it's going to be replaced with rich memories that are part of the legacy that Pelly leaves us. And the sorrow is going to ease, and we will endure because it's really the marvel and the essence of life and its continuation. And when you talk of life, what a life filled with triumphs and achievements. And I think it all goes back, it was spawned in 1959 when Pelly was eight, because in that year a team called the Flyers was born. And in the ensuing years, this young Swede began to formulate a dream. He wanted to make that dream a trip to North America, to play hockey, and to conquer the toughest position in the world's toughest game. But as he approached the teenager, the dream began to refine even more, because Pelle now wanted to make that challenge in a place called Philadelphia, because there, because there he had an idol who had already become a legend in this building. And it was his dream to become the best and to have his name on the Vezina Trophy alongside this idol, Bernie Ferrand. And so the work... <laughs> and so the work began, the Swedish national team, the Olympics, the Maine Mariners, and then fate magically intervening, he was drafted by Philadelphia. And it took three years and a superb relationship between the old legend, Bernie, and the new one, Pelly. And I think a marvelous part of the story that in the finest tradition of the melting pot of this country, when you think about it, last year, this Swede with a fellow countryman, a Czech, a Finn, Americans, and Canadians had a spectacular year. And that team drove him to the top of the mountain culminating last spring in Canada when his idol presented him with the highest achievement that they could give him, 
the Vezina Trophy, and finally his name was there. And so, and so that far-fetched 100,000 to one dream that began so long ago, so many thousands of miles away came true. He was the best. And when you add to that that he was admired on two continents, he was honored in his homeland, and he was loved in Philadelphia. And you put together his marvelous personality and the manner that endeared him to everyone with whom he came in touch. And you add to that that he was able to share all of this with a fiance who made his every day a joy. And I might add a young lady whose courage and strength this past week has been magnificent. And then you add to that the ultimate, the ultimate triumph that posthumously through the mark of transplant is given life to two people this week. It is the fulfillment of a life far beyond what most or any of us in this building can expect or hope to achieve in a lifetime twice or three times as 26 years. So as Dave Pullen said yesterday, Pelly is indeed to be envied. And in a sense, I think all of us here should be envied because of the blessing of kind circumstance, we were permitted to be part of this extraordinary person's life. And so we all in this building owe fate and the Gumper our eternal gratitude. And now another member of our Flyers family, Father John Casey. Do we have to hold that ice? Do you want to hold it for me? Dear merciful God in heaven, we need your blessing tonight. Oh, how we need your blessing. We've had a terrible few days since the tragic news of Sunday morning. We ask you to bless Pelly's mother and dad, his beloved Shastine, the wonderful Snyder family, the Tobins, the Scots, the Allens, the Clarks, the Flyers staff, and all of you up there in the stands, the loyal, faithful Flyer fans, and finally, over here to the left, the Flyer players, with Captain Dave Poulin, Coach Mike, EJ, Paul, Pat, Bill, Bernie, Sudsy, Kurt, and all the gang. Oh God, you in your infinite wisdom know what this loss has meant to all of us. You know how hurt we are, how crushed, how desperate we are for your blessing. That's why we ask you tonight. You know too much, you know too how much the little Gumper, the friendly, smiling little Swede meant to this hockey team. He was a real, honest to goodness flyer with all that that implies. He was proud to be a National Hockey League player and prouder still to be a flyer. He loved his flyer sweater and the number 31. Do you wonder why we ask you to bless us tonight? As if this loss is not enough, the loss of Pelly. Guess who are our guests tonight? Dear Lord, yes, the Edmonton Oilers the Stanley Cup champions. We, we, 
we ask God to give us the strength to be worthy challengers to the reign of the Edmonton Oilers. So we conclude now with gratitude to the Oilers for helping us out on a very difficult evening and an impossible situation and ask you, God, to bless them for their kindness. Almighty God, with your help tonight, we promise to carry on and make Pelly proud of us. You told us to love one another. You repeated that commandment many times. And you know better than any one of us how Pelly lived that command of yours. So give a special blessing now to this, the teammates of Pelly Lindbergh uh, as they skate out on the ice tonight w without the smiling, the loving, the gracious, fun-loving Gumper and who carried such a wonderful report card to the throne of Almighty God. God bless you, Pelly, and pray for us. I think you should know that the entire Lindbergh family is here tonight with his fiancée, Shastine, and they... <laughs> they, along with the players and coaches and management of the Flyers, would like to thank each of you for your kind expressions of sympathy. Your support at this extraordinarily difficult time was so much appreciated. There was nobody more thrilled in all of hockey that a two-syllable chant in this building was changed from Bernie to Pelly. He said earlier in the week it was like losing a son, and I would think there would be no more appropriate spokesman now for this organization than Bernard Marcel Ferrand. Thank you, Eugene, Mr. and Mrs. Lindbergh, Shastine, friends and friends, fans of Philly. As I stand before you tonight, I feel that our hearts are one. Every single one of us lost someone we respected someone who made us very happy, and someone who made us hopefully proud. Every single one of us lost a friend, a man who loved hockey, a man who loved his family, and a man who loved the fans. No single moment in my entire career has been as difficult as this one. For this one is filled with flashbacks of one of the most memorable and positive relationships the game of hockey could ever produce. Flashbacks of a young boyish goalie from Sweden who relied on me to teach him how hockey in America is played. Flashbacks of how this same young boyish goalie brought to my own life a sense of purpose and accomplishment. 
the paper have said I was his hero. I wish I could tell you how much I admired him. I wish I could have only told him this. Told him how much I admired him, how much I care about him. A goalie stands on a very lonely island, and I'm grateful that I was able to share some of that island with him. But for too brief, a period. Pelledenberg had become, without question, one of hockey's greatest goalies. And when death defeats greatness, we all mourn. And when death defeats youth, we mourn even more. But as we mourn, we must strive to define those qualities that Pelle left behind that can give us strength throughout this period and beyond. I personally feel, and the team also feels, that Pelle Lindbergh left a legacy to all of us. Kelly Lindbergh had the sense of determination second to none. His spirit, his will, was made of iron. His ability to bounce back from defeat and setbacks will always be imprinted in my memory. His determination to become the best goalie in the National Hockey League was to totally evident to all of us who knew him. And when he became the best, his superstar status did not go to his head. Pelly was still Pelly. Behind that white mask and behind that super talent was a boy. Young, naive, and sensitive. Whose friend, friendly twinkle and engaging in this innocence drew people to him. Pelly was friendly likable, anxious to please. He loved the fans and he loved kids. When he signed autographs, he knew he was making the fans happy and that made him happy. Most of all, Pelly loved life. And at the saddest, and the saddest thing about this tra tragedy is that while his positive attitude and love for life helped him to overcome defeat, he could not defeat death. But in a way, he has. Pelly is already giving life to others. And what Mike Keenan has appropriately called the ultimate save. Kelly, you will always live in our hearts. Kelly, we miss you. There is one journey left for Pelle to return to his beautiful Sweden, where a nation waits to greet its son. And that country in his last trip 
brought to my mind the last stanza of a familiar and haunting poem by Robert Frost. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. Indeed, he has miles to go before he sleeps, but on the journey, the affection of thousands of us and the love of those teammates will act as silent escorts and will, we pray, make the Lindbergh's family peace and Pelle sleep deep, enduring, and serene. Now, ladies and gentlemen, would you honor Pelle Lindbergh and his country as we present Hildegard Lindstrom singing the national anthem of Sweden. <laughs> Thank you all. I went to those hockey schools all the time uh, during the summer, and there was always some uh, national team goalie there helping all the youngsters out. And I, I was at the hockey school for uh, uh, since I was 10 years old almost. I went there at least six, seven years in a row, and uh, every summer I learned something new from the big heroes over here, and uh, I read different goaltenders' tips and all kinds of stuff like that. And uh, that was a really nice tournament for us. Uh, we were the only team who didn't get beat by the U.S. We tied them 2-2, or they tied us 27 seconds to go in the first game, and we were really disappointed, but it ended up to be uh, the only team who didn't get beat by them. And I had a lot of good memories from that uh, Olympics. It was a lot of fun, and uh, one of the best things was that the uh, U.S. won against, uh, that they beat the Russians. The bigger rings over in Europe make the goal is to play more in the net and over there you have to play around the net you have to use your stick more and I wasn't used to that and and uh, when they sh shoot the puck in around the net and everything everything is bouncing out in front of the net and that's completely different compared to what I'm used to from Europe at that time I was really disappointed especially the first year that I was sent down I never they never gave me a chance to to play in the National League or anything but they told me that it was just for a year or maybe a year and a half 
to get used to the American style of playing or North American style. And uh, they told me all the time that just do good here and learn the style and uh, you know learn to play around the net and everything, and then you're going to get a good chance to play in the National League. So I believed and I worked really hard in the American League. Well, there was times when I was, you know, really disappointed and, you know, a lot of bus rides and all this and that. And I was playing the national team in Sweden and I asked myself, what, what am I doing over here in the minor leagues here and I'm never going to get a chance. But somehow I said to myself, one day I'm going to play in that national league. And I've always been like that. I've always wanted to, to play in the national league. And I said, I'm going to give it three years and I'm going to try my hardest. You know, first year, the first European goal you ever make an all-star game. And then you come in there and the... Uh, Gretzky made almost a fool of myself. I mean, he scored four goals in a couple of minutes. And so I played in Canada Cup 1981, and uh, uh, I thought it was really tough to start to play hockey in July, or even over here they started one training camp in June already. And uh, after that Canada Cup, I had a terrible uh, fall in hockey with uh, with the Flyers, and uh, you know I was really tired of hockey already in uh, October, November. Well, Bernie been my coach but he's also been one of my best friends since I came over to uh, America or to the Flyers. The first year in Maine he came up and it was not only hockey we talked about, he, he took me out for dinner so we were sitting talking about everything, boating or fishing or and he was like a good friend over there, he was a guy I could talk to about everything and, or anything. I think it was the last game against Quebec in that series I got hit by a puck slap shot from the blue line right on the kneecap and uh, it was really sore that day and the next day, but then it almost went away and put a lot of ice and stuff on it. And uh, so the first, the first two games against Edmonton, it was sore, but not, not so bad as I couldn't play. But then in the third game against Edmonton, up in Edmonton, I got hit on the same spot again uh, with another puck, and then it wasn't the same after that. Okay. Can you look back over your hockey career? What would you rate as your biggest thrill? Uh, no comparison the the final or the. The, the playoffs this year with the Flyers, that's the, you know, that's the biggest thing I ever played. And that was the funniest time I ever had in hockey too, I think. Unbelievable feeling for me, especially for a Swedish guy or a European goaltender to win the Vesna Trophy. That's something you just dream about. On the other hand, I like it when kids come up and they want to talk hockey and they maybe want to have an autograph because I remember not too long ago I was the same way. I, I, I like to talk to the national team goaltenders and and it was, they were great when they wanted to sign one of my gloves or one of my sticks or something like that. So I remember that uh, like it was yesterday. So it's, it's a lot of fun when all the kids come up and they, they want to talk about National League or whatever. So I don't mind, really. What are you shooting for now? What's your next major goal? To win the Stanley Cup. That's the, that's the big thing. That's where the whole team, the organization is working for to win the Cup. Something between stand-up and reflex, small little guy. <laughs> if they ever remember me 20 years from now, then, uh, it's probably going to be some new Swedish uh, super goalie over in North America winning the Vesna Trophy at that time, so they don't even remember me. But maybe some uh, some old players remember me that I was the first European goal to win the Vesna or something like that. I don't know. I don't think anybody will remember me 20 years from now. <laughs> That previous footage on Pelly Lindbergh, courtesy of Hockey Night in Canada. And with us now is the Hockey Night in Canada color analyst, Dave Richardson. And Dave, this has been a very tragic thing, uh, not only here in the Delaware Valley, but I'm sure it's been throughout the hockey world. Uh, how's it affected the people back home in Canada? Well, certainly uh, the first reaction was shock. Uh, Sunday morning and we got the news. Canadians are very attached to European hockey players. Uh, because of the international exposure and because it's the number one sport in Canada. There's no question about it. And when something like that happens, you, you almost take it personally, Bob. And, and uh, the feeling, particularly with the young people, because of the exposure that uh, Pelly got last year with the Stanley Cup playoffs in Edmonton, and uh, I really don't think that they'll ever get over it for the season. You had a personal experience as well Sunday night, uh, you were telling me this morning. Well, uh, yeah, exactly. We have some youngsters. I ha I'm assistant coach of a team back home, and, and the reaction by the young people, and we, we almost had to stop practicing and have a meeting and, and explain the situation, uh, all from the cars, all from the drinking aspect of it, and how to put everything back in the right perspective. And uh, 
I think it is something that, uh, that will live in the memory of young people who are around at that particular time. I know that Winnipeg has a couple of Swedish players, uh, Thomas Dean in particular, and you're very close with the Winnipeg Jets because you cover them uh, just the same way that Ed Van Epp and I cover here with the Flyers. Well, Thomas tried to do an interview for television the other day, and, and he just couldn't get it done. He couldn't get it done. He said he, uh, he grew up with Pelly. He was 12 years old. They've played pretty much all their hockey together, and uh, he's a quiet-spoken individual anyway, Thomas, and they never did get it on. So you can see how it affects people right around the world, uh, Thomas being one incident in the peg, and when we go to Edmonton because of the closeness of the finals last year, I was in Calgary the time before, and Hawken Lube was there, the, the, that fine Swedish player. So. Uh, his personality, not only his playing ability, the fact that he was a fine human being, I think that's the thing that they remember mostly and will always remember. You play the game, and I know you had a similar situation uh, when you were playing with uh, Baltimore in the old American Hockey League. Well, we were uh, practicing uh, on November the 22nd, 63, in Washington, uh, the day President Kennedy was uh, shot, and, uh, of course, the entire nation was numb from the whole thing. Uh, it, it, was, uh, it was like uh, time kind of standing still. But the amazing part was that we played a couple nights l uh, later, and as professionals and uh, with the fans, everyone seems to, to bind together when things get tough. Everyone seems to react with the right way. They take their emotions and they channel it right back into the game. And I think that's what's going to happen tonight. That's one I think a lot of people are concerned about, uh, how the players are going to react. How will they perform? Not only the Flyers, but the Edmonton Oilers as well, because I know they're very uh, affected by what has happened. Well, there's no question about it. Uh, Bob McCammon has a close touch right here with this hockey club. Uh, they met last year in the, in the playoffs. But I, but I think the fans and I think uh, the quality of the individual that Pelly was and, and the emotion that both these teams will have once they get on that ice I think there will be somewhat of a relief and I think they will have that feeling of almost like a big rock taken off their shoulders and I think when they have to the natural instinct and reaction to the game will take over this is a, a, a thing where it happens most of the cases in the off season where you can adjust a little easier uh, this is during the season is to a young player on the rise or if not almost at the pinnacle of his career uh, that makes it harder do you think oh there's no question about it I think any other situations that have uh, come to mind in hockey in my case uh, uh, maybe Tim Horton was the only other one I think that was very close to the season some other youngsters in the off season Thurman Munson is the the only other athlete that I can re remember right in the middle of the season and I think that's why it'll be with us all year Bob I think that's why it'll stay here because of the the high profile that this hockey team has that this particular individual has and I don't think it's something that you can just blot up but I think that the, the game itself and the quality of people involved in the game will push it back and go on. Best that it is the two best teams right now. No question about it. I think that that's, uh, if there is a positive and a bright side to it all, is that two quality teams are going to play after the aftermath. Thank you very much, Dave. Thank you, Bob. We'll be right back. back here with the Flyers vice president, Keith Allen. Keith, uh, this is the second time we've had to deal with this, uh, uh, a death in the Flyer family, in a sense. Barry Ashby, of course, the first one. But this one, I think, is somewhat different than that with Barry. Yes, it is. Of course, this was sudden and, uh, and unexpected. Uh, in Barry's case, uh, he had leukemia, and uh, we all knew it was going to be a struggle if he, if he made it. Unfortunately, he didn't make it, but it was a, a month, I think, from the time he learned that he had the disease till he died. And I think uh, the Flyer family and his players uh, became accustomed to the fact that he may not make it. And so it wasn't as big a shock when, when he died as it was with, with Pelly. One of the things you have to pick up the pieces, and that's always the toughest part. Uh, how hard is it for management when you have to really start getting back to reality in a sense and, and think of the team and think of the future? Well, of course, uh, losing both of these individuals put a big hole in our lineups. And uh, losing Pelly in the start of a season like we have uh, makes it almost impossible to replace him. He was the first all-star. He was 
recognized as the best goalie in, in hockey right now. And you just don't find those fellows very easily. And uh, uh, as you're aware, we're playing Darren Jensen tonight, a young fellow that we think has has good promise. He certainly played well in Hershey this year, and we've all scouted him quite a bit, and, and he's done extremely well. And uh, we had planned on bringing him up uh, later in the season uh, uh, to look at him, and, and, and certainly I think he deserves a chance. Unfortunately, uh, this is a rather a, a difficult time for him to come in and and uh, attempt to do a good job. But I'm confident he will because he's a, he's a game little guy, and I think he'll do well. Everybody around the National League, of course, is always saddened. Uh, it's I wouldn't say amazing, but it's always uh, comforting to know that even though you have differences and you're always trying to do better than the other guy, that when something like this happens, they always rally to your side. Oh, I don't think there's any doubt about it. I think that uh, it shocked the whole the whole hockey community and uh, and the whole sports world, in fact. And uh, uh, especially when you you get a, a player of Pelly's stature that uh, is killed, it's it's really a shock. And uh, I I think that. Uh, uh, Bob has probably heard from everybody in, in sports right now. I know that the switchboard has been uh, constantly filled with telephone calls, not only from, from other sports people, but also from fans in this area. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. Keith Allen. We'll be back right after this. have just finished uh, flooding the ice. The Zamboni just making the final pass around the rink to before we start the, the game itself. We get the Edmonton Oilers and the Philadelphia Flyers and I understand Eddie that it, the teams wanted to have the ice flooded after the ceremony so that they can regain their composure and and try and, and settle their their nerves and also their feelings. I can understand that and I can appreciate that Bobby but by the same token it's been a long time since they had their warm up you know, before they get back out there right again here and get going at it when the game starts. But uh, uh, I'm looking forward to the game this evening. And the reason why I say that is because, uh, you know, these guys are professionals on both teams. And I'm sure they're going to go out there and they're going to, you know, give 100%. And uh, we'll have a very, very entertaining hockey game and a very, very difficult evening. As you can expect, uh, all the signs that are hung around the spectrum are for Pally Lindbergh. I think it, the fans are a little bit apprehensive as well. They ain't not sure how to react. And as we talked about it, you and I, and of course Dave Richardson, and saying that as the game progresses, I think that uh, everything will will come out. You can't say you get back to normal, uh, but it would at least it'll. Uh, well, we're talking about the fans, Bob. We're talking about the fans and the players and everything else. And I think there's one thing we haven't really mentioned that maybe might be worthwhile mentioning. Uh, you being an ex-goaltender, as Darren Jensen called up from Hershey, he is on the hot seat. It's incredible. Uh, the young man, his first National League start was in the island against the New York Islanders, uh, which was not successful. And now his first start at home in the Spectrum happens to be through a series of events tonight. And uh, it's a very, very difficult situation for a young man to be uh, thrust into. When everybody came through the turnstiles tonight, they they handed out a small card about the size of a hockey card or a baseball card with Pelly picture on the front and then on the back. Very simply stated in loving memory of Pelly Limburg, our goalie, our friend. And 31, the sweater number that Limburg wore and that will I'm sure will be retired here at the Spectrum and nobody else will wear that jersey. 